Now, we're still in the book of Proverbs. We are learning God's wisdom for life together. And uh, you'll remember that we've said each week that uh, to be wise is to be capable to deal with the realities of life. To have wisdom is to see things as they really are, under the surface. To see things not just as they appear, but to think further and deeper about the realities of what, what's happening underneath, what's happening behind the scenes, and to be able to deal with those realities. Now, today we're turning to our words, wisdom with words, the words we speak. How can we use our words wisely in a way that actually honours God, that honours our brothers and sisters, that honours the power God has given us in our words? What do our words reveal about us and how do we deal with what they reveal about us and how do we live out uh, God's calling on our lives through our speech? Or to put it another way, we're going to be looking at the topic of wisdom under three kinds of headings. The, the problem and power of our words, the solution to the problem with our words, and the call to live wisely with our words. And so let's start then first looking at the, the problem and the power of our words. And there'll be a couple of uh, verses, select verses throughout Scripture on, on the screen there with us. So... When there are many words, sin is unavoidable, but the one who controls his lips is prudent. By rebellious speech, an evil person is trapped, but a righteous person escapes from trouble. A tongue that heals is a tree of life, but a devious tongue breaks the spirit. The words of a person's mouth are deep waters, a flowing river, a fountain of wisdom. And then this is Jesus speaking in Matthew uh, 12 there. Brood of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil? For the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. A good person produces good things from, the storeroom, from his storeroom of good, and an evil person produces evil things from his storeroom of evil. I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will uh, have to account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. And then the passage that Sarah was referring to in James. So too, though the tongue is a small part of the body, it boasts great things. Consider how a small fire sets ablaze a large forest. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue, a world of unrighteousness, is placed among our members. It it stains the whole body, sets the course of life on fire. And it is set on fire, uh, sorry, and it itself uh, is set on, f- I can't really read that, on fire by hell. So the wisdom of words, t- Proverbs tells us, a person's mouth are deep waters, a, li- a flowing river, a fountain of wisdom. And we learn that death and life are in the power of the, uh, are in the tongue, that the power of death and life is in our words. Now, you will have heard it said that, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones and words will never hurt me. We teach this to our children, don't we? we when they get called nasty names on the playground or, um, or they have to deal with, you know, the fact that the school bully said they smell or whatever. Uh, but the reality is that actually our words are more powerful than sticks and stones. And we have to wonder why that is. Why is it that what we say is so powerful? I think scripture makes uh, the case that our words are actually part of our image-bearing nature. Our words are divine things. We get our ability to speak and communicate from God. In, uh, in his book, uh, The Magician's Nephew, C.S. Lewis uh, pictures the scene where Aslan, you know, the great lion, the one who is supposed to represent God in the story, sings Narnia into creation. And it's a, it's a beautiful image, and I want to read for you just a a little bit from there, so bear with me. So in the darkness, something was happening at last. A voice had begun to sing. It was very far away, and Diggory, the boy in the story, found it hard to decide from what direction it was coming. Sometimes it seemed to come from all directions at once. Sometimes he almost thought it was coming out of the earth beneath them. Its lower notes were deep enough uh, to, to be the voice of the earth itself. There were no words, there was hardly even a tune, but it was, beyond comparison, it was the most beautiful noise he had ever heard, so beautiful that he could hardly bear it. Then two wonders happened at the same moment. 
One was the voice that was suddenly joined by other voices, more voices than you could possibly count. They were in harmony with it, but far higher up the scale, cold, tingling, silver voices. The second wonder was that the blackness overhead, all at once, was blazing with stars. They didn't come out gently one by one as they do in a summer evening. One moment there had been nothing but darkness, and the next moment a thousand, thousand points of light leapt out, single stars, constellations and planets, brighter and bigger than any in our world, and there were no clouds. The new stars and the new voices began at exactly the same time. If you had seen it and heard it as Diggory did, you would have felt quite certain that it was the stars themselves which were singing. And it was the first voice, the deep one, which had made them appear and made them sing. It goes on to say, The eastern sky changed from, uh, from white to pink and from pink to gold, and the voice rose and rose till all the air was shaking with it. And just as it swelled to, it mighty, to its mightiest and most glorious sound, it yet produced, the sun arose. Diggory had never seen such a sun. The sun above the ruins of Chan looked older than ours, but this looked younger. You could imagine that it laughed for joy as it came up, as its beams shot across the land, and the travelers uh, shot across the land. The travelers could see for the first time uh, in the place that they were in. They were standing in a wide valley, though uh, through which a broad, swift river found, wound its way, flowing eastwards towards the sun. Southwards there were mountains; northwards, lower hills. But it was a valley of mere earth, rock and water. There was not a tree, not a bush, not a blade of grass to be seen. The earth was of many colours. They were fresh and hot and vivid. And it made you feel excited until you saw the singer himself. And then you forgot everything else. It was a lion, huge and shaggy and bright. And it stood facing the risen sun. And its mouth was wide open in song. And it was only 300 yards away. Now, what Lewis is doing here is he's attempt, attempting to capture in some creative way the power of God's words when he spoke the world into being. Because it's actually through words that the world was made. He literally spoke the things into being. He said, let there be light, and it was so, and he saw that it was good. And he said, let there be an expanse, uh, a separation between the waters. Let the night and the day separate. And it was so, and he saw that it was good. God spoke the world into being. Words are divine things. They have power, and our words have power because we are made in God's image. The problem is, as powerful as our words are, the reality is that our words have been corrupted because our hearts have been corrupted by sin. Proverbs tells us that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Isn't it interesting that we did not need to coach our kids how to say mean things to a piece of paper? The reality is our words have been corrupted by sin. But Jesus puts it pretty starkly in Matthew 12, doesn't he? He says, I tell you that on the day of judgment, people will have to account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. And what is Jesus doing there? He is saying that our hearts direct our words. It is what is inside us that help us or that that shape the way we speak. By our words we will be condemned. That's pretty shocking, isn't it? I mean, consider your life for a moment. If you only ever got judged on whether your words produced life or death, how would you go? To be blunt and perhaps a little bit provocative, if Jesus stood here today and he said to us, okay, I'm going to forgive you every sin you ever did. doesn't matter if you killed people, stole millions of dollars, whatever. You're forgiven for all of those things. I will judge you purely on the way you used your words, the things you have said. How would you go? How comfortable would you be with that assessment rubric? Would you pass the test? Of course, we would all fail miserably. 
Even though we are given a hint of the power and the majesty through, uh, you know, of God through our image-bearing nature, and our, the fact that our words can create life uh, as we build people up, the reality is we most often, or very often at least, use our words and the power they have to destroy and to tear down and to kill. James tells us that our words, our tongue itself is set on fire by hell pretty stark thing to say and the reason we say the things we say is because our tongue is unredeemed it is impassioned by the very passion of hell and the reason for that is because our hearts are not yet fully surrendered to God to Jesus we haven't been fully redeemed by his power and it is a problem we all share I am like this and you are like this. We are all like this because we are works in progress. We use our words to bring death and not life because our hearts still harbour our old nature, our old self, our sin. But there is actually a solution. We don't actually have to stay that way because when Jesus comes, he comes to die not Uh, on the cross not just for our sin but actually to fix our heart to fix the very thing that drives our wicked words let's have a look at the solution here this is from john chapter 1 verse 1 to 14 it says this in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and he was with god in the beginning all things were created through him and apart from him not one thing was created that had been created in him was life And that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. I think I'll just leave it there and then skip to verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed His glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So how do we deal with the fact that our words diagnose our heart, teaches us that we need to be saved? What is the solution to our word problem? Well, as we like to say, Jesus is the answer to all our problems. But it's actually true here too. Because Jesus did what was necessary to deal with the consequences of our, of our bad words and also the cause of our bad words, which is our heart. He also models for us the perfect way we should use our words. And so Jesus comes and he deals with our sin problem, our heart problem. Now, you see, we we tend to think of what Jesus does on the cross as this transaction between God's justice and his mercy. That is, on the cross when Jesus dies, he takes our sins from us and he dies in our place and our slate is wiped clean. Every bad thing we've ever done, every hurt we've caused, every, uh, you know, every, every, sin we've committed is wiped away on the cross we are washed by jesus's blood no matter how fallen we were we are redeemed when we accept the free gift of salvation that jesus offers and of course that's true that's the basis of the christian faith that's the foundation and the cornerstone of everything we believed and without that truth everything will start falling apart but that's not the full picture of what happens there is more than just our sin and badness getting taken off us and put on Jesus and then die, and him dying in our place. It is absolutely that, but it's more than just that. You see, when we accept, when we believe, we don't just give Jesus our bad life. We actually get his good life given to us. It is like a, a kind of cloak or jacket that you can put on, a perfect life you can wrap around yourself. It's not just a divine transaction that takes place where our sins are paid for. It's also a divine swap where we, we get what he deserved. We get his perfect life instead. And then as Jesus' spirit, the Holy Spirit, comes to take residence in our hearts, we are set free. And our broken and wicked and bad hearts are revivified. You know, they, they, they're given new life. We are made spiritually alive again from that, from that moment on and it sets us on a new path, a new trajectory. We're on uh, a different path. Instead of being stuck in our sin and the bad patterns of our life, 
we're finally free to follow God, follow Jesus, be the people He made us to be. Our wicked lives are swapped for Jesus' perfect life. And the old path we were on is swapped for the righteous path of following Him. But now we actually have to participate in that too. You see, we are expected to follow Him in His footsteps. In response to what Jesus has done for us, we now have a new life that is to be lived in response. And that applies not just to the big sins of, you know, murdering people and stealing a million dollars, but also to the way in which we use our words. We are called to pursue Christ in how we speak. As the wisest person that ever lived, Jesus actually shows us what it looks like to perfectly use our words. He calls us into a new way to speak. So what does that actually look like? What does, it, what does it mean to follow Jesus with our words? Well, let's look finally then at what, uh, what Proverbs and the rest of Scripture say. The call. A gentle answer turns away anger, but a harsh word stirs up wrath. A word spoken at the right time is like uh, gold apples and silver settings. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Oh, sorry, dwell richly among you. In all, wisdom, uh, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing to God with the gratitude of your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And I'll get to the others in a little while. Now here's the situation. Jesus uses words in one of three different ways. On the one hand, his words are quite redemptive. You know, he, he uses, and embody, uh, uses words in a way that embodies Proverbs 25.11. A word spoken at the right time is like golden apples on a silver setting. It honours you. It brings life. It feeds you. This kind of encouragement is like what happens in Colossians there. The, let the word of Christ dwell richly among you, teaching one another, growing one another, using songs and hymns and spiritual songs, speaking in gratitude to God. These are the kind of words that help people grow, to speak kindly and well and honorably. And we know what this is like, right? We are all familiar with this kind of word where someone says something to us to encourage us, to build us up, something compassionate, something life-giving. And the church is called to do this all the time and often. And Jesus does that. He uses his words like that. But there are also times when Jesus said nothing at all, where his silence spoke more than his words. Isaiah 53 verse 7 says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter and a sheep's, uh, like a sheep silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Or again in 1 Peter 2 uh, verse 23, when he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Now Jesus was in this case standing before the authorities of the day. He'd been arrested for doing nothing wrong. And they accuse him and they hurl insults at him and they tell all kinds of lies about him. And yet Jesus' words are conspicuously absent. He says nothing. He doesn't answer their insults. He doesn't correct them. He doesn't defend himself. Jesus knows that there are circumstances in life where saying nothing at all is in fact the wisest thing to do. Perhaps Jesus stood before the Sanhedrin, you know, the, the ruling court of the day, with a tense atmosphere, where the witnesses are brought in, twisting words, making up stories, and the crowd outside gets drawn into the whole affair, and as he listens to their accusations, he remains silent, not because he's confused about what's happening, but because he chooses not to speak. He knows that nothing he will say will change their minds. The mob has already decided what should be done with him anyway. He knows he must die to stand in our place. 
But actually his silence speaks louder than if he had used words. His silence condemns the ridiculousness of this mock trial. There is a kind of deep dignity in the silence of Jesus. His lack of words, his silence is a powerful statement. It is a testimony to the righteous life that he had lived. And the fact that he says nothing speaks to uh, the fact that the truth does not need a defense. His life is his own testimony. And friends, the reality is that there are times in our lives where the absolutely loudest thing you can say, the most impactful statement you can make is to say nothing at all. And it seems to me that this is often the case when you're dealing either with someone who is unjustly arguing or accusing you, who has already decided that you are guilty, or when defending yourself will make things actually end up worse. But it is right at times to say nothing at all. It follows Jesus' footsteps and it can be very powerful. And so Jesus uses words kindly to build up and encourage and all of those things. And sometimes he uses no words to say things too and we can follow him in that way. But the third way is that Jesus actually also uses words to condemn and to warn people. And if we're serious about following Jesus, we actually need to grapple with that reality too. Matthew 16, Jesus turns to Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me because you are not thinking about God's concerns but human concerns. Or again in Matthew 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you don't go in and you don't allow those entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You travel over land and sea to make one convert, and when, one, uh, and when he becomes one, you will make him twice as much a child of hell as you are. Or again in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Therefore, repent and believe the good news. Now friends, here's the thing. People confuse being Christian with being a nice person, an agreeable person. But there are times when Jesus is anything but, disagree uh, but agreeable. There were times when he said some very confronting things. I mean, if Jesus just went around preaching, love your neighbor, be nice to one another, he would never have gotten into trouble with the Sadducees and the Pharisees and he would never have been killed for his faith. He would never have been crucified. But that isn't what happens. Jesus came to confront the world. He tells people, repent and believe. You can't call someone to repent unless you point out their sin, right? He calls the Pharisees, the religious leaders, you hypocrites, you children of hell. He calls his chief apostle Satan at some point in time. Like that's pretty offensive, right? But notice that in each and every case, Jesus' offensive words have something to do with correcting people, with putting them back on the right path. Jesus didn't have an issue with someone being on the ruling council, the Sanhedrin per se. He didn't have an issue with people in authority specifically. We see, for example, how Jesus deals with Nicodemus, who was one of the members of the council, and he helps him come to grips with his need to come to God in faith. And after Jesus was crucified, this same Nicodemus is the one who helps prepare Jesus' body for burial. Being in power is not the issue Jesus has with the Sanhedrin. His issue was the fact that, that um, particularly the Pharisees stopped people from coming to God in the first place. They made having a relationship with God almost unbearable, unattainable. That's why Jesus was angry at them. They blocked people from the very thing that he came to do, to redeem the world so that people can be friends with God. And so he t uses his words to attack that. He calls people to repent and believe and that's offensive because how can you repent unless what you, you know what to repent from? He tells people to go and sin no more. How can you do that without first saying you are sinning, right? We need to be re confronted with the reality of our sin. We need to, to know that we need forgiveness in order to seek forgiveness, right? 
And if we're going to be true disciples of Christ, then we're going to need to use our words sometimes like this too. Sometimes that means we're going to use our words uh, redemptively, kindly, to speak words of healing and encouragement and truth. We're going to be following Jesus. Our words will, will build people up, speak life, encourage one another and so on. When we follow Jesus occasionally, it will mean that we say nothing at all. Wisely using our words sometimes means we don't use our words at all particularly in the face of the unjust or when our words are going to cause more harm than good, our silence will speak louder. But if we are serious about following Jesus, then we will also be brave with our words because we cannot shy away from speaking truth when we need to. With wisdom, yes, but sometimes we will have to. But then we should use it the way Jesus does, to help people be more like the people God created them to be, to redeem them, to put them back on the right path of following Jesus. And perhaps we can grow in that together. So this week, let's consider how will we use our words wisely. Let me pray. Lord, as we consider what you call us into here with wisdom with our words, we, we need to come to grapple with the reality that our words have power, that they are part of our divine image-bearing nature, but they also diagnose our hearts. Lord, we pray that you will redeem us. We thank you that on the cross you have already paid for all our sin and that through your Holy Spirit you are changing us from, in, from the inside out. You are redeeming us and making us different. And so we pray, Lord, that you will give us wisdom. Wisdom to know when to speak kindly and encouragingly and upbuildingly. Wisdom to know when to say nothing at all. But also wisdom to know when to confront things, to help people turn back to you. We pray that your Spirit will help us do that well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.